in the spirit of forward thinking, uh, let's confuse ourselves a little bit by looking at these many arrows and curves in this plot. But it, it feels like we live in a time where automation is at the door and we are increasingly adding algorithmic reasoning in all kinds of areas of our society. And um, it raises many questions, undoubtedly. And many of these are quite complex. I borrowed the title of the algorithm game from a paper in a legal journal. Um, and what they reflect on there in, is in an economic context is the fact that as we introduce algorithm, algorithmic logics into society, people will find ways to game these logics to get an advantage. And I think what's, what's interesting when we introduce an algorithm is that this is actually something that, I mean, certainly that we have designed, um, also in a way that we have complete auditability over. I mean, we can see exactly what the code is. In a way, we, we, know, we know exactly why things are done. Uh, perhaps we can't predict the outcome because it's really random, but we, we can look into these, these, uh, these boxes and we can figure out what's going on. And to understand a little bit more about what might happen in an economic context in a market, what happens when you put some algorithms in a market and they compete, we will look at a very simple example. Let's consider a market duopoly, a simple two-player game where, in our scenario, OpenAI and DeepSeek are deciding on the pricing for their chatbot. Now, these, these are priced per million tokens. So currently, OpenAI charges about $2.5 per million tokens. And uh, DeepSeek released a few weeks ago uh, at uh, about $0.28 per million tokens. Now, this price has actually increased uh, since the weekend because it was a limited time offer. But very clearly here, DeepSeek is undercutting the price of ChatGPT. They're trying to attract demand uh, to their own platform. Uh, they are competing in this market um, with a, without many other players. Certainly there are a few other players, but we'll just restrict ourselves to this case where we'll just keep imagining as there are these two representative players. And so in a, in a Bertrand duopoly like this, uh, we assume that the lowest price takes all demand, which of course is not quite the case for, uh, for the real market. Uh, and, but there, we also know that there is a, an equilibrium uh, defined by the marginal costs of the two companies um, at which neither company would have sort of an incentive in a one-shot game to raise their price because they would lose out uh, on the market. But in, in this case, with two companies so sort of ably uh, using their their machine learning technologies, it's quite reasonable to assume that they might use some algorithms to determine the price of their sort of their, their, their next price in a repeated market. And of course, illustratively, we can just play around and ask, ask these models what they would do if they were to price their next, uh, their next sort of, yeah, the next day or in the next period. And sure enough, they give very verbose answers for why they would pick one or another price. Uh, ChatGPT says we could pick $1 or 0.75. Uh, DeepSeek says we could pick 50 cents or a dollar. We could update uh, their prices. And uh, they've now sort of reestablished um, on a new uh, level of demand that they capture. So this kind of pricing is, uh, is happening constantly all around us. And what, what, might be we, what might we be concerned with is collusion. Now, collusion isn't just setting of high prices. It's not illegal to set high prices. Collusion is an act of communication between two entities that agree to set high prices uh, rather than pricing at a competitive um, competitive level. And it is similarly defined both in US law and in European law. However, not all collusion is illegal. 
sort of not all setting of high prices is illegal. Of course, um, one could be very, very stupid and set high prices, and that's clearly not something that would be illegal. But there are also very clever ways of reaching agreements. Um, Heinrich was talking about punishment schemes earlier, where there could be a mutual understanding between two companies that if they lower their price and undercut their opponent, the opponent will undercut them in sort of thereby punishing them. So it's not really rational in the first place to lower the price. So, so prices could be kept artificially high without an explicit communication. And this is well recognized in the law. This is not a, not a surprise. It's, if anything, it's one of the shortcomings of our way of understanding competition and market or of how that might bring about consumer welfare. And the reason why it's not illegal to have these reward punishment schemes is that they are, it's almost, it's close to impossible to verify this kind of interdependent pricing. We can't look into the mind of a manager to determine whether they are reasoning in these terms, nor, nor would we really like to, I would, I would argue. Um, so the question when it comes to algorithmic pricing is, do algorithms make this kind of tacit collusion much easier? Does it become uh, much easier to achieve this kind of non-communicative agreement with another party, which leads to higher prices? Will we, will we see higher prices in a market where we have a lot of algorithms? And then what does this kind of collusion look like? If we are to see more of it, what does it look like? And a third question is, can we distinguish it? Can we tell, just by looking at a market, whether the kind of collusion that we are seeing is one where there was or there wasn't communication? Can we distinguish the illegal kind from the legal kind? And so, of course, there's quite a literature that looks at, at, at many of these things, and we are making a contribution here. However, I won't discuss it too much because they make some weird assumptions. Uh, and so part of our contribution is actually um, adding some insights into what we think are reasonable assumptions in these settings. But some of the collusions that they find are of the sort that we see on the screen, this sort of focal price collusion, which is just a, a high, stable high price, but also a cyclical kind of collusion where prices rise and decrease, and basically the opponents are just undercutting each other at each step. And interestingly, we also find this kind of collusion uh, between gas stations um, that, uh, that aren't necessarily even using algorithms. And all of these uh, findings, and what we will be doing as well, is using the method called Q-learning. And Q-learning is a very simple reinforcement learning method. It has a Q table that we use to store basically all the beliefs of a, of a learner at any point in time. And in this case, it's going, to, it's going to encode the opponent's price and our price, sort of the, yes, the, the company's price, the ego, egoic action, and a value is associated to each of these that is learned over time by interaction with the market, by repeated play of this duopoly. So then we have three learning parameters, which are going to be quite important in our exploration. And the learning rate, alpha, says how quickly do I learn? How quickly do I update my beliefs on the basis of the new pieces of information? The exploration rate, epsilon, governs how often we explore. It's the probability of doing something random. And gamma is a discounting factor, which tells us how myopic we are, or, how, or inversely, how much we care about the future. We have this decision policy, an action policy, where we see the exploration rate appear. And this basically, so here is where we see how the exploration rate works. With the probability one minus epsilon, we do what we think is best, given the opponent's price. But with the probability epsilon, we do something random. So that's where we explore. So epsilon is the probability that we explore and do something completely random. And finally, we have the 
equation that determines how we update our beliefs given a new piece of information. So given that our opponent set a price and we take, we set a new price for the next round where our opponent then sets a new price and we achieve a particular reward, so a particular profit from uh, in, in the market duopoly, how do we update the belief of taking an action given the previous opponent's price? And alpha, the learning rate, tells us how quickly we learn. So, um, and gamma weights the future. So what if, what can we do in the next step given the new opponent's price? It tells us again how much we care about the future. And so to analyze this further, we set up what we call the metagame, which is a shift of in perspective to considering the case where it is not, it's not these algorithms competing. It is the algorithm designers competing. The players of the metagame are the Q-learning algorithm designers. So OpenAI and DeepSeek. And what they do is they pick some learning parameters. They parameterize their learner with alpha, epsilon, and gamma, which to a machine learning crowd would be the hyperparameters. So they're not, they're not the weights, they're not the beliefs that are learned in the course of learning, it's what determines how an agent learns. And the payoff for these players will be the average profit in the repeated duopoly. So they play a duopoly for many thousands of steps against the opponent, parameterized in a particular way, and the average of their profits over time is what we use to determine their payoff. So do, do algorithms make tacit collusion easier? And in short, in our system, it seems so. So we can represent our entire parameter space in this 3D plot where we have three, um, three axes and the three learning parameters. And on the screen, we have these symmetric combinations where both players set the same parameterization. Um, and the dark regions are sort of collusive outcomes. And we can see that the only non-collusive outcomes are for an exploration rate of zero, sort of this, this face. Um, so but what we can intuit from this space is that for all these symmetric combinations, the, the outcomes are quite collusive. It's almost like if we just pick some parameters at random, we will get some super competitive prices. But the would we pick parameters at random, right? If we, if we want to pick the best parameters against our opponent, what will we pick? And so for this, we also need to consider the cases where we look at an asymmetric deviation of the opponent to a different parameterization. And so what we see in this case, here arrows point from one parameterization to the other. So from the opponent to the best response, and we actually find an equilibrium. It's a pure symmetric equilibrium in the center of sort of of this large circle. Um, we, we see other, so the, the other circles are best responses. So they are, they are a best response to some other uh, parameterization in the space. But eventually all the paths point to uh, the Nash equilibrium. And this is a symmetric um, equilibrium. So both players want to play the same parameterization. And this is rational for them. They do not wish to deviate to any other set of learning parameters. And so this particular combination has a relatively small alpha of uh, 0.1, a relatively large exploration rate, uh, close to 0.25. So that means that with about a quarter probability, you will do something random, you will explore. And then it has a relatively low discount factor on point 0.22. Um, this is interesting in comparison to some of what the literature has explored, but I will not say much further on that. So the final point is that if we're actually looking at what might be the most collusive outcomes. So what if, what if two players were actually trying to collude and weren't acting rationally with their parameters, but they were somehow trying to coordinate with the opponent? And then we find so that we look at the Pareto front, and we find that all these 
combinations are very asymmetric. So whereas the natural equilibrium is symmetric and there's a unique pure equilibrium, these collaborative Pareto front combinations are asymmetric. So one player acts very differently to the other. And what we often find are quite exploitative combinations. So one player sets very random prices, the other is much less random, so it can exploit the randomness of the other player. And we end up in these uh, asymmetric combinations. So how does this collusion look like? At the Nash equilibrium, we find the following kinds of patterns. So it seems the algorithms have learned to price at the equilibrium price where they may sort of below which they wish not to go. And that's where the vast majority of their prices lie, but occasionally they jump up. They're quite random, so they occasionally jump up. And in these jumps, they are able to undercut each other and achieve some, uh, some advantage. So this is at the Nash equilibrium. Whereas at the Pareto front, where you had these highly asymmetric combinations, which achieves sort of higher, um, sort of even higher super competitive prices, we find somewhat similar behavior, but now there are intermittent regions of stability, you could say. You know, they're, they're able to consistently set higher prices. It's still rather noisy, but there are also somewhat larger cycles in, uh, in this behavior. And if we look at the best response networks for these two comparisons, so Nash and Pareto uh, on the right, we find that in the Nash case, sort of everything points to the equilibrium prices, whereas in the Pareto case, we have some, psych some more cycles, we have um, also longer trajectories to the equilibrium prices. And so these are just best responses of what was learned. So the, where, the, where you get the noise is from the exploration rates. And so you could imagine uh, a noisy exp explorative action popping an agent out to some price combination here, which then eventually sort of best responses back to the equilibrium prices. And finally, we can distinguish statistically with uh, kolmogorov smirnov test, we can distinguish the pricing at the Nash equilibrium from the pricing at the Pareto front and from some other combinations, meaning that we can tell whether or not two players are rash have rationally picked their parameters against each other. So we can, bas we can basically tell you if they are legally colluding. Um, so those are our insights for potential regulation. Algorithms make tacit collusion easier. In fact, it seems quite ubiquitous. But the kind of tacit collusion that we will find is very noisy. It's not obvious to see. But we can distinguish it from rational, so we can distinguish the rational kind of collusion from a communicative type of collusion. So thank you very much.